Hey guys, it's Lori, and today I wanted to talk to you guys about the 10 things that can hurt a mortgage deal from an underwriter's perspective. The reason why I want to talk to you guys about this today is because of the simple fact that it plays into a big part when it comes to buying a home. And right now, with the interest rates being so low, you guys are really going to want to know these top 10 things to avoid, okay? So stay tuned. So as I explained earlier, I'm going to go ahead and give you guys 10 uh, things to avoid when it comes to the loan process so that way it can be as smoothly as possible. So let's go ahead and get started. So number one is job hopping. So this is the number one thing to avoid, right? You guys know what job hopping is. If you don't, I'll explain it real briefly, okay? So job hopping is basically moving from one job to the next, right? So, you know, a lot of people will say like, you know, if they hate their job, you know, whatever, they're going to make sure that they have another job lined up before they quit their job. So the reason why this is an issue is because if it happens multiple times, um, basically the underwriter wants to see that your money is coming in constantly from the same place. And they usually want like two years of work history. So, you know, we want to avoid job hopping because I mean, let's be realistic, you know, it's 365 days. For a year to go through so if you're job hopping every couple of months then man you're starting a new two years all over every time you, you job hop right so we want to avoid that so that way we can get you guys approved for a good loan okay all right so number two is having gaps in your work history okay so this kind of ties in with number one and i'm sure you guys can see why right having uh gaps in your work history basically that means that there's a time frame between job a and job b so whether that time frame is a week, a month, a couple months, you know, or a year, um, it's there, right? So, and again, basically having gaps in between your job history is basically it's going to give you, it's going to negatively impact you from obtaining a, a loan because of the simple fact that an underwriter is going to look at this and say, well, dang, you know, January through February, I mean, he had a job. January through March, he had a job, right? But then April... In May, he wasn't working. Then he started working again. And it's just going to be like time periods where you're like, you're working, not working, not working, not working. And it's just going to look bad because when they give you a loan, right, when they give you a loan, it's going to be for 30 years. And for you to have that unsteady income, you know what I mean? It's going to be a problem because you're not going to be able to pay your bills. Okay. So let's move on. So number three is having previous foreclosures, right? So... The reason why this is an issue, I'm sure some of you guys can assume, is that, hey, if you foreclosed on a property before, you're probably more likely to do it again, right? So we want to avoid having this at all costs, okay? So number four is having more than one bankruptcy, okay? I'm sure you guys can see why this is an issue too. So why would we give you a loan for something that you can't afford? Because clearly you can't because we see that you're claiming bankruptcy. So let's avoid that, guys. Let's just not do it, okay? So number five is if you have numerous open collections, right? So what do I mean by that? Let's say you um, you had a bill and you didn't pay it and they kept asking you to pay and asking you to pay and then finally, you know, they just stopped asking because they realized you weren't going to pay, right? So what they do is they send it off to a collection agency and then that person starts pestering you, right? But not as much, right? So um, usually that'll happen with like maybe a hospital bill if you didn't have insurance and you just didn't pay the bill or like, you know, maybe a Bright House bill. Well, they're not Bright House anymore, they're Spectrum. So like, let's say, you know, you had internet with Spectrum or whatever and, you know, you just went a couple months, you never paid it. They were pestering you about paying it. They decided, okay, cool. You're not gonna pay it. We're gonna send it off to a collection agency, right? So now you're thinking everything's all cool because you know you just got your internet installed again under somebody else's name, so you're all good, fine and dandy, right? Not <laughs> because when it comes to buying a house, right? Those um, bills that went off to collections, those are gonna pop up on your uh, credit history, your credit report, right? So if the if the underwriter sees that you have numerous of those, what does that tell them? Basically, it tells them that you don't pay your bills. <laughs> so why would they give you a loan if you're not going to pay your bills, right? So number six is NFs on bank statements. So what are NFs? Basically, those are non-sufficient funds, right? So when you um, when you're going to go to get a loan, the underwriter is going to scrutinize your bank statements to make sure that your finances are in order, okay? So if at any point they find something like this where there's non-sufficient funds, 
um, aspect on your, your bank statement, that's going to raise a flag for the underwriter, right? And they're not going to want to give you a loan. So it's going to make it more difficult for you to obtain a loan, okay? Number seven is having all gift funds as your finances, right? So this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but let me tell you why, um, you know, underwriters see this as a negative, right? Or it makes them suspicious, let's say. It is because of the simple fact that usually when this is the, the case, there's no paper trail to tell where that money came from, okay? It's it's just like as if I said, okay, cool, I want to buy a house, right? And I came up to that house and I had $250,000 in a duffel bag and I said, here, I'm purchasing the house, right? It's frowned upon. We don't do business like that, okay? So, because there needs to be a way to tell where that money came from, right? So, if this is your situation and you have a lot of money in gift funds, it's just going to be really important that you have all the proper documentation to show where that money came from and you'll be all right. Okay. So number eight is having a large increase in your household expenses. So I wrote down a little equation here for you guys to understand it a little bit better. So we can go ahead and go into it. But basically what this does is it raises a flag for the underwriters because of the simple fact that if your, your, your expenses go from you know, a steady rate to something higher. So let's say that you had your expenses set at $1,200 a month, right? So you're $1,200, $1,200, $1,200, $1,200. And then you go to $2,200, $2,200, right? That's a problem because of that, that sudden increase right there. And it was such a large increase. You know, it just, it, it doesn't sit well. And let me show you why, okay? So let's say that your monthly income is $2,000, right? and you have a monthly expense rate of $1,200, leaves you with $800, right? But now you might have a prospective mortgage of 700 bucks, right? So you add that in to your expenses, right? And that gives you a total expense of $1,900, right? Which will leave you at the end with $100, okay? Guys, don't worry about this because this is just an example. So we know that this probably wouldn't be approved of, right? But anyway, let's just say that you increase your expenses by $1,000, jumping to $2,200, right? Still, you're only making the same $2,000 a month. So you're already in debt because by $200 because, you know, you overspent, okay? But let's say that they look at that and now you have a mortgage, prospective mortgage of $700, right? That brings you to a whole total debt, race, total debt, um, sorry. That brings you to a total expense of $2,900, right? So, and you can see why that's an issue because your income is only $2,000. So now you're negative $900. Do you see why that's an issue? So if you have a sudden increase like that, it makes it harder for them to approve you for a mortgage because you might end up in debt, right? You might end up not being able to pay your bills. So that's why it's so, an issue. Number nine is retaining primary. So you're holding on to your primary residence before you purchase something new. So the reason why that's an issue is because of the simple fact that when underwriters see this, they know automatically that it's going to increase your debt to income ratio, which is a bad thing, right? Let me show you why it increases your debt to income ratio so you guys can understand. So let's say you have a house, right? And it's a one bedroom, one bath. And um, it's, you know, a husband and a wife, they live together or whatever, they pay hundred, they borrowed a hundred thousand dollars for the house, right? And they paid off twenty five hundred or twenty five thousand dollars, right? And so now, so now they owe um, seventy five thousand dollars, right? They owe this. That's owed. So they have a one bedroom, one bath. Let's say this husband and wife, they end up having a kid, right? So now they need a bigger house because their family's expanding, okay? So they move over here, they, or they want to move over here. And this is a two bedroom, two bath. And let's say it's priced at $250,000, right? So they're gonna need a loan for that one as well. The problem is, is that this couple, their, their, their total income together, their yearly income together is $40,000, right? So this is their total income, $40,000, right? But they still owe $75,000. So 75 plus 250 would be $325,000, right? 
and this is now their deck. So when an underwriter is looking at the situation because you want to hold on to this instead of selling it first to buy this, it's increasing your debt to income ratio, right? Which is not good because $40,000 trying to purchase something for $320,000, $25,000, you know, it's going to take you a long time to pay that off, okay? And, you know, especially if you have other uh, expenses, you know, for the month other than your mortgage. So, okay. number 10 is having any late payments in the last 12 months. And the payments that we're talking about are the ones that are being reported to your credit bureau, right? And they're on your credit report. So we're talking about credit cards, we're talking about car loans, uh, you know, possible if you had previous home loans, whatever those loans are, whatever those payments are that you're making every month on those loans, they're looking at those. If you miss any of those, it's gonna be a problem, okay? So we wanna avoid that at all costs because what that's gonna do is it's gonna make it difficult for you to obtain a loan, okay? And we don't want that. We want the process to go as smoothly as possible, okay? So, <clears throat> so uh, the reason why, if you guys don't understand why this is a problem, I'm gonna explain it to you very briefly so that you can understand it a little bit better, okay? So let's say your brother or sister asks you to borrow $100, right? But you know that they're not good at paying people back their money, right? So you're not so willing to give that person $100, are you? because you know that there's a good chance that you're not gonna get that money back. So the same thing applies here, guys. If if you're going out to get a loan for $100,000, however, the underwriter sees that, hey, you haven't paid your credit card bills in the last six months, or you've been paying them on and off in the last six months or whatever it is, right? That They're gonna look at that as the same situation, like, hey, you may not pay your mortgage bill you know, or you may pay your mortgage bill the same way you pay your credit card bill every other month, right? So we want to avoid that, guys. All right, guys. So that's pretty much the end of the video. I've given you guys the 10 things to avoid when it comes to the loan process. So that way your uh, home buying process is as smooth as butter, okay? So if there's any questions that you guys have, go ahead and feel free to leave them down in the comment section below. Otherwise, you can reach out to me on any of my social media accounts, which are also linked below in the description. Other than that, that's it, and I will see you guys on the next one.